Thank you for joining me for this month's webinar on behalf of the Employment Group at Two Temple Gardens. Today, I'm going to be looking at the implications for those in the employment sphere of the passing of the snappily titled Worker Protection Amendment of Equality Act 2010, Act 2023, or the WPA for short. This Act received Royal Assent very recently in October 2023, and as we shall see, it has the potential to change the landscape significantly insofar as workplace harassment is concerned when it comes into force in October next year. The starting point for my talk has to be the wording of the WPA itself, which in section one inserts a new section 40A into the Equality Act. New subsection 40A1 of the Equality Act, which is set out in full on the slide, provides that an employer must take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment of its employees in the course of their employment. And in so doing, introduces for the first time a positive legal duty on employers to take steps to protect their employees from a specific form of harassment. As no doubt many of you will already be aware, the current position is that whilst the taking of all reasonable steps can be relied upon by an employer in defence to a discrimination claim, including a claim for harassment, by virtue of Section 109.4 of the Equality Act, meaning it's advisable for employers to take such steps, there's no obligation on employers requiring them to take those steps proactively. As a result, from a policy perspective, the aim is no longer to focus simply on punishing unlawful conduct after the event, but instead to focus more on preventing such conduct from occurring in the first place. The question, which no doubt many of you have in the light of the wording on the slide, is what will the WPA mean for employees and employers in practice? And the answer to that question depends on both the scope of the new duty and the consequences for non-compliance. However, before I look at those two points, I'm first going to touch briefly on the background to the WPA. The initial impetus for the reform of the law relating to sexual harassment in the UK came from work done by the Women and Equality Select Committee in the light of the Me Too movement, and in particular from their report of July 2018, which was pre prepared by the committee after it heard evidence from witnesses from a wide range of backgrounds. As can be seen from the extract on the slide, in its report, the committee expressed surprise at the low level of successful employment tribunal claims for harassment of a sexual nature, and it concluded that one of the reasons for that was the current legal framework for dealing with claims of workplace harassment, which it felt wrongly put the burden on individuals or employees to hold harassers and employers to account. Recommendations which the committee uh, eventually made, some of which ultimately formed the basis for the WPA, aimed to, to combat that perceived problem. Um, those recommendations included the introduction of a new mandatory duty on employers to protect workers from harassment in the workplace and the reinstatement of the duty on employers to protect workers from harassment by third parties, such as customers or clients of the business. Following the committee's report, the government then consulted on the key recommendations, including the two recommendations I've just mentioned, which consultation led to the uh, WPA bill, or the Worker Protection Amendment of Equality Act 2010 bill, which in due course became the WPA. Moving on then to consider the practical effect of the WPA for employers and employees. As I mentioned at the outset, this will depend both on the scope of the new duty and the consequences for non-compliance, and I'll address both of those issues in turn. In seeking to ascertain the likely scope of the new duty, it's necessary for us to consider who the duty applies to, the context in which it applies, and the conduct which it applies to. The first two points can be taken relatively shortly in that the wording of the new section 40A1 of the Equality Act makes it clear that the duty is imposed on employers only 
to protect their employees from uh, certain conduct which occurs in the course of their employment. And obviously for this purpose, the usual definition of employment for discrimination purposes as set out in section 83 of the Equality Act will apply, such that it will cover those engaged pursuant to contracts personally to do work, as well as those employed under a contract of employment or apprenticeship. So the application of the new duty is therefore entirely coextensive with the right to claim for unlawful discrimination in the tribunal. Of greater interest, however, is the limitation on the type of conduct the new duty applies to. Some of you may have noticed that the combined effect of sections 40A, 1 and 2 of, uh, of the uh, WPA is that the new duty only requires employers to take reasonable steps to protect their employees from sexual harassment and so from unwanted conduct of a sexual nature. The duty does not, therefore, require employers to take reasonable steps to prevent harassment related to sex, which is not of a sexual nature, um, or harassment related to any other protected characteristic, or indeed to prevent harassment more generally. However, the most important limitation on an employer's new duty uh, relates to the meaning of the phrase reasonable steps. So what steps will be held to amount to reasonable steps for this purpose? The first point I want to highlight in this respect, that the duty requires an employer to take reasonable steps and not all reasonable steps. It does not therefore exactly mirror the scope of the reasonable steps defence under section 1094 of the Equality Act, and instead it imposes a lower threshold for compliance. In so doing, the WPA departs from what was originally intended by the Worker Protection Amendment of Equality Act Bill. Uh, by contrast, the bill, before it was amended following its passage through the House of Lords, created a duty on employers to take all reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment of their employees. And it remains to be seen what difference this ostensible watering down of the duty makes in terms of the protection provided by the new duty for employees. No guidance as to what amounts to reasonable steps for this purpose is provided by the WPA itself. Uh, instead, it's anticipated that further guidance in this respect will be provided by the Equality and Human Rights Commission when it publishes its statutory code of practice. Whilst the anticipated code of practice has still not been published, in January 2020, the Equality and Human Rights Commission published its Sexual Harassment and Harassment at Work Technical Guidance, upon which, after it's uh, been updated, it's expected that the code of practice will eventually be based. Sections four and five of that guidance deal with when an employer will be deemed to have taken all reasonable steps to prevent harassment and precisely what steps are required for that purpose. And it's essential reading for those uh, dealing regularly with workplace harassment claims. Whilst that guidance was prepared before the WPA came into force and it addresses the reasonable steps issue in the context of a defence to a discrimination claim, by analogy, the guidance is likely to be equally relevant to compliance with the new duty when it comes into force. In summary, that guidance provides that in deciding whether a step is reasonable, an employer should consider its likely effect and whether an alternative step would be more effective. And an employer is entitled to weigh how effective a step might be against other factors, such as the time, cost and potential disruption that might be caused by taking the step in question. So a step that's expensive, time consuming and troublesome to implement would not be a reasonable step if it achieves nothing. Conversely, if a step would be effective, then that may outweigh any other negative factors. The most accessible summary of the type of steps which may be considered to be reasonable for an employer to have to take, uh, bearing in mind that general guidance, is set out in the Equality Human Rights Commission's accompanying guide for employers entitled Preventing Sexual Harassment at Work. That guide, which was also published in January 2020, sets out seven steps which the Equality and Human Rights Commission recommends employers should, con should consider taking to ensure that they're doing all they can to prevent and deal with sexual harassment. Again, those steps are likely to be relevant to compliance with the new duty. 
The seven steps set out in the Equality Human Rights Commission's Guide for Employers are summarised for you on the slide. However, unfortunately, um, that's no substitute for reading the guide itself, which contains further detail as to what is required by each of those seven steps. The practical effect of the WPA does not, however, depend only on the scope of the duty which it imposes. In addition, as I said before, it depends on the way in which the duty is to be enforced. The first point to note is that even after the WPA comes into force, an employee will not be able to bring a freestanding claim against his or her employer for breach of that new duty uh, to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment in, in the tribunal. Rather, any claim has to be pursued alongside a separate claim for sexual harassment brought in the usual way. If that claim succeeds, and if the tribunal is satisfied that the employer was also in breach of the new duty under Section 40A1, it can uplift any compensation awarded by up to 25%, having regard to the extent of the employer's contravention. So the worse the contravention, the higher the likely uplift. And that follows from the new Section 124A of the Equality Act. In addition, although it's not directly relevant to employees seeking to claim, breach of the new duty will be enforceable by the Equality and Human Rights Commission using their existing powers of enforcement. Again, that seems to reflect the aim behind the WPA, that is to prevent sexual harassment rather than just to provide a remedy for individual wrongs after the event. That concludes what I wanted to say about the new duty to prevent sexual harassment in particular, but no talk on the effect of the WPA would be complete without consideration of its effect on an employer's liability for third party harassment. That issue can, however, be dealt with quite quickly. In short, the WPA, as currently drafted, has no effect on this area of law at all. Despite concern expressed by the Equality and Human Rights Commission in July of this year about the removal of the proposed protections against harassment by third parties from the Worker Protection Amendment of Equality Act 2010 bill, the WPA as enacted includes no such protection. As a result, uh, as things stand, the law relating to an employer's liability for third party harassment by, for example, customers or clients remains unchanged. However, Labour included reference to tackling third party harassment at work in its Green Paper and Annalise Dodds um, and Angela Rayner on behalf of the Labour Party have committed as recently as October of this year to introducing a standalone legal duty requiring employers to take all reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment, as well as to protecting workers from harassment by third parties. So it may therefore be that we see further change in this area, depending on the outcome of the forthcoming general election. Finally, I want to highlight a couple of future developments uh, which are worth watching out for. In its statement welcoming the WPA, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission confirmed its intention to update its technical guidance on sexual harassment following a full consultation. At the same time, the Equality and Human Rights Commission indicated that this updated guidance would set out the steps that employers should take to comply with the law. And that will no doubt, like the current version, include specific guidance on what steps will amount to reasonable steps. And this in turn is likely to form the basis for the statutory code of practice in due course. Both of those publications are therefore likely to be invaluable to those advising employees and employers as to their rights and responsibilities in relation to workplace harassment once the WPA comes into force. So that concludes today's webinar. I do hope you found it useful.